So in Unit 10, we built a model to predict a response variable um, by fitting a straight line to a sample data set. So if we were calculating from a sample, that means that the intercept and the slope, B0 and B1, are statistics, right? These are numbers that were calculated from the sample. And just like any other statistics, they're going to vary. They're going to vary from sample to sample. So if I took a random sample and calculated the slope, and you took a random sample and calculated the slope, we wouldn't expect to get exactly the same number. So here we've written it in terms of the predicted values. Uh, we could also write an equation in terms of the actual values, um, but here we'd have to include the residuals, right? Because our points aren't going to be exactly on the line. So E, which is what we're using to represent our residual, is the distance between the actual and the predicted values. Right? The distance between actual and predicted values. So those are both expressions to describe what's going on in the sample. But we want to draw inferences about the true relationship between X and Y in the population. So notice here I've written it in um, Greek letters instead of regular letters. So beta 0 and beta 1, those are the parameters. So remember, parameters are numbers that describe the population. And because they're parameters, they're generally unknown, right? We don't usually have the whole population, um, but they're not changing from sample to sample. So they're unknown, um, but they're un unchanging. Um, I did want to point out this little epsilon here. Even if we knew the true population slope and intercept, there would still be variation around the line, right? Even in the population, there's still variation around the line. Okay. So let's go ahead and write our hypotheses here. So we want to know, does a linear relationship really exist? Does it exist in the population? Or is it plausible that the sample slope happened just by chance alone? Okay, so the null hypothesis is going to be that beta 1 equals 0. So your slope is equal to 0. And this would mean that there is no linear relationship in the population. So when the slope is equal to 0, no linear relationship. Even if this is true, even if there's no linear relationship in the population, that doesn't mean your sample slope is going to come out to be exactly zero, right? So looking here, we've got this big population of points. Notice that the slope here is zero, and I'm going to take a sample of size 20. So you can see I've got the, the blue points are the 20 that I selected out of that population, and this gray line over here is showing that it's got a slightly positive slope if you look at those 20 points. Here's another one. Um, for this 20 points, I've got a slightly negative slope. So you can see the slopes are going to come out a little bit different each time. Right? So they're going to be centered at zero, but you've got all different slopes that you can get. So basically the question is, is the slope different enough from zero to convince us that it didn't occur by chance? All right, so the alternative hypothesis here, usually this is a two-sided test. Usually we say beta 1 is not equal to 0, and that would just be that there is a relationship in the population. So we're able to conclude that there's a relationship in the population when our sample slope is further than we'd expect just by chance, further from 0 than we would expect. So before we get into the details about this, I want you to just kind of use your intuition here. Um, so I have four different graphs. I'll label them A, B, C, D. So I've got four different graphs there. Um, and I want you to think about which of these graphs provides the strongest evidence against the null hypothesis and which provides the weakest evidence. And what is it about the graph that tells you that? So pause the video there for a second um, and just use your intuition to think about the strength of evidence. All right, so which of these graphs provides the strongest evidence against the null hypothesis? Um, that's going to be D here. And there's really two reasons for this. We can look at the steepness of the slope. This is a pretty steep slope. Um, a and D both have steep slopes, um, but D has the points falling closer to the line, right? So it's even more clear that there's this positive relationship. 
And then which one provides the weakest? This is sort of for the opposite reason, right? It's got a really flat slope, so pretty close to zero in the first place. Um, B and C both have pretty flat slopes, um, but because of the small amount of variability in C, at least that slope is pretty clear. Um, whereas in B, it's really hard to see if there's a positive relationship at all. So this intuition is going to go into our test statistic. So if you think about D and what made this strong evidence, um, you had a large slope. So notice that's the numerator of your test statistic. And then you also have very little noise around the line, right? Your points are falling close to the line. And the amount of variability around the line, that's one thing that's measured by the standard error. Um, as usual, the standard error also takes into account sample size, okay? Um, but because all of these have the same sample size, they're comparable. So if you've got a large slope and you've got very little noise, this is gonna give you a large t-statistic. So by this point, you're used to this question. When we say a large t-statistic, how large is large enough, right? How large does it have to be to convince us? Um, and we need something to compare it to. So we're gonna compare it to a t-distribution, and the degrees of freedom here is gonna be n minus the number of predictors minus one. So this semester, we're only gonna look at situations where we have just the one predictor. So like earlier, we were looking at just age as a predictor of car price. And so our degrees of freedom is gonna be n minus one for the one explanatory variable, minus one. So we're gonna end up with n minus two degrees of freedom. Okay, so this is showing a t-distribution with n minus two degrees of freedom. And what that represents, these are the values of t that you would get if the null hypothesis were true. So in this context, the values of t, if there were really no association. Okay, then you use this t-distribution um, the same way you've learned in previous units. So you would find your t-statistic, whatever your t-statistic is, and you would shade the values that are more extreme. And if we're talking about a two-sided test, which we usually are, um, you're also going to look on the other side and shade there. So that's the general idea of a t-test for the slope, uh, but we'll get to more details in a later video.